Good morning. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, by way of introduction, my name is Ted Logan. I'm a director for BlackRock, based in the London office. I've had the pleasure of working with Shropshire County Pension for nearly four years. Um, today, my plan is quite simple. I want to answer three simple questions. Who is BlackRock? What do we do? Where do we come from? What is a hedge fund? Why do we invest in them and how do they work? And then finally, what we do for Shropshire County Pension. What do we do for you? We'll talk about our performance and where the performance drivers come from. Now, I've been given 45 minutes in the agenda, but we budgeted plenty of time for questions, either after the presentation or even uh, in the lobby. I'm here with my colleague, Simon, who's in the audience. Um, we're happy to take questions on this presentation, markets in general, um, or LGPS uh, governance. So who is BlackRock? Um, some, some of you may have seen some of our TV adverts. We've increased our advertising budget recently. Uh, you might have seen our CEO, Larry Fink, who's quite frequently a participant in the financial talk shows. Uh, but the firm started as a bond manager in the late 80s. And through uh, subsequent uh, acquisitions and growth, the firm now is at 2.9 trillion sterling in assets under management and is now the largest asset manager in the world. We have over 12,000 people around the globe, and in the UK we have 3,500 3 people in offices from Edinburgh down to London. Um, the company does a lot of things. It manages stocks, bonds, it does risk management services. Um, but the whole firm is based on one fiduciary premise. Every investor wants the same thing, and that is to protect your savings and to make that savings grow. So um, if the, the client is a large government trying to save their revenues from oil, or if it's a young family saving for university education, the goal is the same, and that's how they build, uh, the firm has been built. Now within the LGPS community, we have relationships with 78 of the 101 schemes throughout the UK. Um, and we take our role within this community as more than just an investment manager. We have a very active government relations group that works very closely with the regulators and policymakers. And our goal really is to inform our clients before change comes. Um, for example, we're one of the first uh, groups to launch a collective investment scheme um, earlier this year which is basically a group of passive or tracker assets, which is uh, very new at the time. Now, I know this topic may be very top of mind to this audience, so I would suggest we can talk about this in the lobby after the presentation. So, within this large entity, BlackRock, uh, there's a, a division called BlackRock Alternative Advisors. This group focuses exclusively on hedge fund investments and absolute return portfolios. We have 14 billion sterling in assets under management. We have 89 people in five offices around the globe, and we have, been, uh, we have a 20 year track record in doing this. Now these 89 people are composed of research analysts trying to find new hedge fund talent. There's risk analysts that look at the quantitative uh, elements of these portfolios, and there's even operational due diligence analysts. These people actually will meet the hedge fund managers, ensure there's proper controls on how they manage the money, and they'll even do background checks. And what's, what's interesting is we found that 4% of the people uh, actually will lie on their CV. Uh, and we can kind of have a cockroach theory. So if, if someone's willing to, uh, if you see one cockroach, there's probably more. So if someone's willing to bend the truth a little bit, there's probably an issue down the road. Now, that process is quite simple. You just don't invest. Because this business is all about investing in people, and you can't invest in people you can't trust. Now, the business is broken into three groups. There's our diversified portfolios, which are multi-manager, multi-strategy. This is what we do for Shropshire. We have focused portfolios where, this is an example where a client may already invest in hedge funds or absolute return strategies, but they hire us to work on a particular area of the market, whether it's stocks or bonds. The third group is co-investments. And co-investments is where we'll actually invest directly in a security alongside a co-investor, and together, we'll make that investment. 
And this has become more popular recently because we're stepping where the banks are stepping out. Now for all three types of business, they can be delivered in a custom structure where there's only one investor in the fund, or in a commingled structure where there's multiple investors into one fund. Now in the UK, um, we'll just talk a bit about our clients. We have, a, we have a large range of clients and it's globally diversified and we talk about uh, working with different insurance companies, foundations, um, different types of uh, uh, charitable entities. Um, Taft-Hartley plans you'll see on the graph. These are effectively pension funds for U.S. labor unions. But the two groups that we have most experience with are uh, uh, governments and pensions. In the U.K., we have over 32 clients. Uh, and for local, uh, for LGPS clients, we have over 220 uh, million in assets under management. So now talking a bit about BlackRock, I'll, I'll go into what a hedge fund is. Now, I've done my best to limit the jargon, um, but I want to, I think it's important to kind of talk about what they are, because there's lots of noise about what hedge funds are, and there's different types that approaches a hedge fund investing. So I wanted to start with how you compare hedge fund investing to traditional portfolios. The core thing to remember is that there's greater flexibility in a hedge fund portfolio. There's more tools in the toolkit. Firstly, they can invest in a wider range of assets, where traditional portfolios will invest in stocks or bonds or cash. Um, hedge fund investors can invest in stock bonds and cash, but also they can invest in currencies like Japanese yen or um, US dollar. They can invest in commodities like oil or gold. And they can also invest in derivatives. Now derivatives would warrant an entirely different presentation. Um, the analogy I'd want to use is simply, the, the derivatives are kind of like the stuntman to Daniel Craig in the Bond movie. They're very similar and he can do amazing things, but they're entirely different. Um, let me move on to styles of investing. In a traditional portfolio, it's typically buy and hold. In a hedge fund portfolio, there's a lot more options. You can employ uh, buying and holding, but you can also do short selling. And again, short selling would warrant another discussion, but the important thing to remember is short selling is where you can, an investor can benefit if the price of the asset goes down. So if you combine those two things, you have a greater range of ability to express a view. There's also fewer structural limitations. Whereas a traditional portfolio, let's just say for example, if you were invested into um, like a unit trust. If you invest in a unit trust, there's strict regulatory constraints on what you can invest in, um, what benchmark you're tracking, and, and the limitation of leverage. And leverage is simply borrowing more money than you originally had to make a bigger investment. And leverage can magnify gains, but it also can magnify losses. And in the unit trust, there's limitations in how you can do that. In a hedge fund strategy, you have greater flexibility when you want to employ these type of tools. There's also, and finally, there's return objectives. If you look at a traditional portfolio, say a UK stock manager is going to be measured against the FTSE 100. In a hedge fund strategy, um, they're measured against a performance target or an absolute return target. In the case with Shropshire, our performance target is cash plus 5%. So we're expected to make that type of return, irrespective if the stocks go up or down or bonds go up or down. In summary, the hedge fund manager has a greater range of uh, tools to express a view. So for example, we've heard a lot about what the Fed might or might not do in December. If the hedge fund manager believes they're going to raise rates, they can do a couple of things. They can buy stocks <coughs> with companies that are big consumers of raw materials, oil, nickel, gold, etc. Because typically when interest rates go up, these raw materials, the price goes down, which increases the profit margin of that company. That profit goes up, the shares go up. They can also make a, a, an investment in a currency. They can be uh, invest in US dollars against another currency. Because when the interest rates go up, the central banks will effectively increase the price of their currency. 
There's lots of ways to express these views, and that's the whole point of hedge funds, that you have a wider range of, of uh, tools to express your view. So I kind of want to address some of the common misconceptions of hedge funds. As we know, uh, the press does a very good job selling racy headlines to sell more papers. Uh, but I want to address some of, the most, some of the most common things that are brought up. First of all, hedge funds are risky. Now, hedge funds employ different strategies and a different approach to risk. And some take on deliberate risks and some hedge or minimize those risks. And an example of that would be um, there's, there's volatility or the velocity of price change. You know, the FTSE goes up and down quite violently sometimes. That's a risk. There's also um, uh, liquidity. And liquidity is really the ability to sell something at a reasonable price in a reasonable time. And an example of an illiquid or less liquid asset would be your house. It's gonna take some time before you can sell that at a reasonable price. So that's illiquidity risk. Another opposite example would be shares of BT. If you want to sell those shares, you go to the exchange, you get a price, it's liquid. So each hedge fund manager has a different perspective on what risks they want to take. The second thing is that hedge funds always generate positive returns. Now hedge funds with these different tool kit, this broader toolkit, there are times when shares will go down and hedge funds will go up. But that is not a guarantee that every time that happens, they're going to continue to go up. There's different market environments, and it varies per manager. The third is that hedge funds are always hedged. And let me quickly address what hedging really is. It's, it's the idea that as an investor, you're not making an investment to make a profit. You're making an investment to protect a particular price. So uh, a hedge fund manager may hedge their currency exposure. So if they expect the Fed to raise rates, the US dollar will go up. They don't want that. So they will make a hedge against that currency move. Another manager might like that and believe in that and will make an investment for that currency move. So it depends on the manager. And the last one is hedge funds are only traders that are not investors. There are some managers that are short-term investors. There are some that are very long-term, very much like Warren Buffett. The fact is over the last five years, the managers that are short-term have effectively been replaced by machines. These algorithms and uh, systems are sponsored by the banks, and in some cases, the hedge funds are bystanders to this type of technological advancement, and sometimes they're uh, participants. So what are the sources of return of hedge funds? And, and the goal of this slide is to show the complementary nature of hedge funds next to a traditional portfolio. We talked earlier about the sources of return and the sources of risk. Um, if you think about shares, they're really driven by economic growth. And the bonds are driven by, so, so if, if with economic growth, if the economy grows, the company will grow. So the shares are driven by growth, and the bonds are actually driven by the health of the company. So in traditional portfolios, the drivers of return are economic growth. The drivers of risk are primary market moves. In the case of hedge funds, the objective is idiosyncratic risk. It's market inefficiencies. So what does that mean? Idiosyncratic. It's in a case-by-case. -case. It's a deal-specific. It's depending on the circumstances of that particular investment. The goal is to minimize that primary risk or that <coughs> economic growth dependency. An example of idiosyncratic risk would be a very healthy company, strong cash flows, good market share, great customers, growth prospects. And for whatever reason, there might be a legal problem. And to prepare for that legal problem, in the case of a settlement, they might reserve some capital reserves in the event of a settlement. But by doing that, the ratings agency might reduce their bonds from really safe at AAA to less safe at single A. That simple move will create a selling bias. What will happen is there'll be some investors that can only, they're only allowed to invest in AAA bonds, and by that movement, they have to sell those bonds. 
They don't want to, but they have to. And when they sell, the price goes down. And that's an opportunity for a hedge fund manager to buy those bonds, because they know that company is safe. They're a very strong, healthy company. And when the litigation settles out, it's gonna come back up. That's a market inefficiency, driven not necessarily on the fundamental value of that company, but because of external circumstances, an idiosyncratic event. So on the tri triangles at the bottom, what we're trying to show here is the complementary nature. So the, the blue triangle with traditional portfolios, you can see the majority of the risk is represented at the bottom of that triangle. Now there are secondary risks, things like oil services or the oil move or things like uh, emerging markets exposure, but there's very little idiosyncratic risk. Inverted to that in the green triangle on the bottom, you have hedge fund strategies and the concentration is idiosyncratic risk and the goal is to minimize the amount of primary or, or GDP dependency. Now, that's the point of they work well together because they're doing different things. And it's the job of Justin, James, and their consultants to find that right mix. And that's how it fits in a portfolio. So let's take a couple steps back just to give some historical perspective because hedge fund strategies are nothing new. As early as the 1890s, J. Piermont Morgan was very active in the railroad construction in the U.S. And if you think back at that time, the U.S. was an emerging economy. So there was a lot of change. It was difficult to get finances. And he came in and he effectively acted like an activist investor. And you might have heard that term. There's a lot of kind of loud mouths in some of the markets where they try to go and buy lots of shares of the company and create change. Well, that's effectively exactly what Morgan did. Um, another idea that's very old, it's kind of a new word and even a movie, is arbitrage. And arbitrage is as old as trade in itself. And there's records going back where, uh, in, the, in the Middle Ages, where you would buy an ounce of gold for, say, a pound, and go to another town and sell it at one pound, 10p. And that's an arbitrage 10% profit. Now, it was brought to modern finance in 1931 with a book by M. Weinstein, this arbitrage securities, and he, he brought that whole idea to a modern uh, uh, financial framework. Now, I did a little research on this, because this book is quoted in lots of financial literature. And I, could, I found it on eBay, and it's only $5,000. <laughs> <coughs> it's the original. In 1969, A.W. Jones uh, founded what we consider the first hedge fund. And interestingly enough, he started as a journalist. He was working for Forbes, and he's doing an article on these financial technicians. And they were employing leverage and short selling and doing a lot of the things that are common today, but it's brand new back then. He started his own firm with his friends. They were very successful. Um, and in fact, the word hedge fund didn't come into common uh, markets until 1966 when Forbes came back and did an article on him. He was no longer the journalist, he was the subject. And the title was The Hedge Fund Boys. And after that, the word hedge funds, and it brought it to the public, and there was a tremendous growth in the industry since that point. In 1969, there was a very well-publicized book on beating the stock market, a quantitative approach. Um, that this, this introduced the idea of you using quantitative techniques to invest in markets. Again, I looked that one up, and that's only $1,000. <laughs> now, so there's lots of types of hedge fund strategies, lots of types of hedge fund managers. This is really the family tree, or the breakdown of the different hedge fund strategies. There's five disciplines, and with each discipline, there's different sub-strategies. And the way I like to describe this is thinking about what did the hedge fund manager do before he started the hedge fund? So, in the relative value discipline, the far left, this is really looking at the mathematical relationship between one asset to another. So the price of Sainsbury's versus Tesco, or BT and Vodafone, and it requires a lot of mathematics and quantitative analysis. So the people in these types of managers are typically your mathematicians. A lot of the principals of these firms have PhDs in physics or quantitative finance. The second group is event-driven to the right. And events are looking for mergers or spin-outs, IPOs, things that are corporate restructuring. 
There's a lot of legal documentation. You had to look through the prospectus. You had to look at the contract. So typically, these are former lawyers. The third group is fundamental longshore. And these are your former analysts or accountants. Because what they're doing is looking at the financial statements, valuing those stocks and those bonds, and trying to find the right price. So they're more accountants. Fourth group is direct sourcing, and direct sourcing is really acting like a bank. These are former bankers. They will originate a loan, they'll assess the risk, and require an interest rate, and value that according to their analysis, which is what banks used to do. And then the fifth is directional trading. And directional trading is comprised of a lot of the global macro, geopolitical type of financial analysts. Um, these are your former economists. And a lot of times when you read about hedge fund managers and they're quoted in the paper, it's usually this group because they have very colorful views on what the central banks are gonna do next. I'm gonna go through two examples, hopefully to bring this to life, um, and certainly within our time together. Um, the first is uh, direct sourcing. And this is really an example of direct lending. And in the past, and in some cases today, if a company needs capital, they'll go to the bank, and the bank will give them a loan at a market rate. And they're not really giving bank money, they're taking money from another investor or a depositor. Pretty simple. What's changed recently is that because of the regulations and how they want banks to manage risk, a lot of the banks aren't motivated to do lending. We've seen it specifically in the small, mid-sized company space. I mean, I know, you know, on a, on a personal level, it's sometimes difficult to get lending. So these banks are, are, are really limited in how much lending they're able to do. So what that has created, that's an inefficiency, because there's still demand for capital. So what's happening now is you have one firm lending money to another firm directly without a bank, they're cutting out the middleman. And this, this company, firm B, will do their own credit analysis, determine the right rate, the right covenants in that loan, Firm A is very happy because they get the capital. Sometimes they need it in a month, and Firm B is able to start quickly. So that's a whole new uh, area that's in, in tremendous growth. The second idea is merger arbitrage. And I wanted to bring this example up because you read about it a lot. We've read about Kraft and Heinz combining their food empires. We've heard about Time Warner, a lot of these big mergers. It's very popular this year. So the way that merger arbitrage works effectively is company A wants to buy company B. And they're gonna offer a price well over what company B is trading at to make it interesting, because they gotta go excited. So the hedge fund manager will buy company B with the expectation it's gonna go up, and they will sell short expecting company A to go down. So if you think about company A, company B, they're this far apart, they get closer, and then six months goes on because they're negotiating the deal. Who's going to be CEO? Whose office is going to get what? So that takes long, and sometimes you need to consult with the regulator if it's anti-competitive, etc. So over time, that gap will close. Now that manager is taking a, uh, an investment on that gap, that profit. Now, over six months, we know the equity markets can go up and down, but they're going to go up and down together. So you're not sensitive to the stock markets broadly, but you're sensitive to that deal, that idiosyncratic inefficiency. That's where you make the money. So now we talked a bit about what a hedge fund was and how it works. Let me talk about what we do for you. So the Shropshire County Pension Fund has in, been invested in QIP since 2004. So what is QIP? QIP is an acronym for Quellhouse Investment Partners, which is the original firm that BlackRock acquired in 2007. It is one of our oldest, most successful strategies, and it has a 20-year track record. <coughs> it is designed to be an all-weather fund of hedge funds. What that means is it invests in 38 other hedge funds, 15 different strategies, with thousands of different securities, stocks, bonds, derivatives. By working with BlackRock, we're able to negotiate fees where we're saving over 300,000 pounds a year. 
The goal of this fund is to deliver stock market returns with half the risk. And since inception, we've delivered 17 million pounds in profit to the council. So how does that compare? Um, so if you were looking over the one, three, five year time periods, um, we're right about at the target, which is cash plus 5% for one year. We beat that over the three and five year time horizons. Now, if you were to compare that to, say, a peer group, I wouldn't call it an index, but a peer group, which is the HFRI, Hedge Fund Research Institute, Fund of Funds Conservative Index. This is our peer group that utilizes the same investment strategy that we utilize, which is a conservative approach. And we beat that peer group over those three time periods. You'll also notice that we have not beaten FTSE 100. And I just want to say that we've had a tremendous run in equity since the financial crisis over the last five years. And I don't know one economist, one forecaster, or one analyst that thinks that equity markets will do the same thing in the last five years and the next five years. Diversification is key to the success, and we take a very long-term view on how to approach this portfolio. So then I talked a bit about what it is and how it's performed. I want to talk about how it's performed. So the left shows the um, monthly returns of QIP against the FTSE 100. And you'll notice that the FTSE 100 in yellow is quite dramatic. Each month to month, it goes up and down quite dramatically. QIP is very slow and steady. <clears throat> It is very rare that the fund will be up 1% or down 1%. It's usually within that band. It's slow and it's steady. On the right, it shows uh, a five-year return comparison over the five best months of the FTSE 100 and the five, uh, or the, the, the average monthly returns over those five years, the best months, and that average is out at 3.13%. So of all those good months, you're averaging around three. The QIP investment is up 0.8%. So when you have that big run in equities, we're not gonna capture all of that, but we'll capture some of it. In contrast, in the down months, when the FTSE really goes down, you're averaging around 2.4% down. And in fact, in those months, the average return of QIP is slightly positive, it's flat. And so what that means is by minimizing the losses, you get the benefit of compounding. And so over time, it gives you a slow and steady return. The goal here is to be the boring part of the portfolio that's different from your traditional portfolio. So let me um, talk a bit about markets and where we made money over the last year and where we see opportunities going forward. So the first theme is the changing in the street banking model. We talked about the direct lending example, um, but there's other cases where banks are changing the behavior. Typically a bank would be a market maker in a particular security, particularly bonds. And a market maker is simply matching a buyer and a seller. You're a matchmaker. And that instant moment of time, you're taking a little bit of risk to make sure that that order is completed, that match is made. Well, again, because of the regulations, banks are not encouraged to take that risk, and they're making less and less markets. So they're reducing the role as a market maker. Again, that's an opportunity. Markets still need to operate efficiently. There's still buyers out there. There's still sellers out there. A hedge fund manager has the opportunity to step in and serve as the bank and effectively be the match maker, to be the market maker. That's an opportunity going forward. And that would be in a lot of our relative value strategies, which is actually one of the big drivers of the returns of the last 12 months. Second area of opportunity is emerging markets. And emerging markets would be defined as China, India, Mexico. Um, China, given its size, is not going to be an emerging market for long. But they're still working on their infrastructure and building markets where they're less dependent on government intervention. 
So there's still work to do. And an area of opportunity that we saw over the last year was um, the Hong Kong Stock Exchange was connecting with the Shanghai Stock Exchange in what was called the Stock Connect Program. So instead of offshore and onshore, we're building pipes to connect the two. So there are cases where a Chinese company, say a Chinese construction company, had shares in Shanghai, mainland China, and shares in Hong Kong. Same company, same financial performance, two different listed shares. Moreover, the Chinese government would have regulations and limits in who's allowed to invest in A and who's allowed to invest H. There's inefficiencies in those, those two markets. So what you have oftentimes is the A shares are trading at a premium to the A shares. Now that's an arbitrage opportunity. Maybe there's a reason for that. What we've seen some of our managers do is capture that quite quickly because they were effectively uh, going against what the market expected and managed to make arbitrage profits. Now looking forward, they're looking to do the same thing with Sichuan Index or the Sichuan Exchange. So you can see where this whole market is becoming, there's fragmented stock exchanges in, in throughout China and Southeast Asia, and over time they're going to be connected by pipes. And there's going to be teething problems, there's going to be inefficiencies, and those inefficiencies create opportunities for our managers. Another area in um, uh, emerging markets is Mexico. Mexico recently engaged in the private sector to retrofit their oil services infrastructure. So they're taking in more capital, and there's more opportunity to step in and do something. There's sector-specific opportunities. Um, we've all seen the oil price plummet over the last 12 months. Um, and what you're having, what's, what's happening there is you will have three types of companies in the oil services sector. We know about Exxon and BP, but there's all those smaller, mid-sized companies. Uh, there's companies that get the oil out of the ground. There's companies that deliver it to us at the petrol station. And then there's midstream companies that connect the two. And a lot of times these midstream companies, their revenues and their profits are based on contracts, not on the oil price. And what's happened is everyone's running away from oil, anything to do with oil because of the price change. So all of these stocks and bonds are gone down in value. But the reality is that these mid-service or midstream companies are quite healthy and they have contractual cash flows. So there's opportunities there to step in and either buy the shares at a discount or even step in and provide financing because the banks don't want to lend to them because the regulators and their shareholders tell them not to. So they need capital to continue their operation. So there's opportunities to step in there. Fully protected and collateralized by plants and equipment. So you can make very good loans to these companies. Another area is healthcare. Healthcare globally, in the US in particular, because of Obamacare, it's created inefficiencies. Some companies are capitalizing on it. Some are becoming more efficient. Some are stumbling. And that just creates more dispersion of opportunity that the stocks are going out of whack against their fundamentals. There's opportunities there. Um, healthcare in particular uh, over the last 12 months has done very well for this portfolio. There's also opportunities in pharmaceuticals. Um, you know, it, it's more in the US, but every time a congressman talks about drug prices, these pharmaceutical companies go up and down in the markets, and sometimes that's, that's an opportunity. Um, but you know, the, the common theme is when there's volatility or market confusion, Particularly in these sectors, you rely on these sector specialists. Oftentimes, in the healthcare managers are usually former doctors. They can cut out the noise and know what a good company is and what is just hype. And there's opportunity. And the last idea is the alpha environment. Before I can talk about the alpha environment, I should talk about the beta. Um, and beta is really simply passive investment, index investing. And if you were to invest five years ago, and you had perfect foresight, you would invest in a stock index and a bond index, and you'd make a lot of money. Um, but that has been fueled by a global central bank effort with quantitative easing. All of these central banks have acted the same way. Different times, they've done the same thing. They've 
effectively borrowed from the future and provided liquidity and funding to raise the price of assets. So stocks and bonds have all gone up. Now interest rates are nothing. There's, there's limited what they can do. So with the Fed, the probability is high it'll raise in December, but since this is recorded, we don't know. Um, but there's differences of opinions by these central banks. There's um, differences of opinions of which sectors are doing well, which not, there, there's more opportunity and there's more uncertainty. And because of that, it creates more market inefficiency. So the managers that do well will be focused on the alpha opportunities, the idiosyncratic type of uh, opportunities, as opposed to letting a particular asset ride and track an index. So I'm gonna stop there and hand it to Debbie, but again, happy to take questions at the end, uh, and Simon and I will be in the lobby uh, to address any of the questions. Thank you.